Multi Hazards, all about protecting communities. This ain't no one way ticket. Welcome to the thicket of brain waves and epiphanies, grown men crying and matrox winning. Join this fight to protect your kin, your knaves, strong and weak, especially the vulnerable. Multi Hazards is in the house. I ain't here to give you a run around bowl. Join us, friends, sign up to battle. Climate change, human rage, all the sheep and all the cattle. Playing games while nature flames, floods and blows with all the cracks and hacks and terror foes. We're here to win. Hi everyone, this is the Multi-Hazards Podcast, where we take a deep dive into issues in emergency management, climate change adaptation, security, etc. And the main goal here is protection, protecting communities. So welcome, Vin Nelson here. And today, I'm really excited, we have a special guest, Brad Zarnett. He is a Canadian sustainability strategist, writer, and blogger. He is the president of Toronto Sustainability Speaker Series, TSSS, which was founded in 2008 to showcase sustainability leadership and has since hosted more than 40 events. After 12 years of consulting and promoting leadership in corporate sustainability, Brad began to realize that the promise of a more sustainable world was not being delivered. So he decided to take a closer look and what he saw was disturbing. So Brad's current focus is to broaden the conversation as to why corporate sustainability, CSR, impact investing and profit with purpose has failed to live up to its promise. And more importantly, what is the best way forward to ensure that we are able to pass along a functioning planet to our children? So Brad has a master's in environmental studies from York University in Toronto, and you can follow him on Twitter at Brad Zarnett, that's B-R-A-D and Z-A-R-N-E-T-T, Medium, which is a website where he has been recognized as a top contributor in the climate change category, LinkedIn, or by joining his email list. So, dear listeners, it's my tradition here on each and every multi-hazards podcast to say a territorial acknowledgement. Basically, what this means is that I, a Norwegian slash Danish slash Scottish slash British Canadian, I acknowledge that this land I am living on is not Norway, obviously. This is Canada. And what is Canada? Right now, right here, I am on First Nations ground, right? How did I end up here? Well, ask my mom and dad. (laughs) Okay, I just ended up here, right? And I'm kind of stuck. I don't think Norway will take me. I don't know. I haven't tried Denmark yet, right? But This is out of deep respect for First Nations people, and I'm not joking. I am podcasting on their land here in the suburbs of Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. And this is real, all right? This is not just, you know, mumbo jumbo trying to just, uh, you know, say one thing and do the other. No, this is real. And if you're a First Nations person listening, I want to say I respect you. And when I meet First Nations people, there is an automatic connection between me and you. I know it's weird. It's kind of mystical. But, you know, I have studied and I have met people and I have, I've just immersed myself in the real history of Canada and First Nations issue. I've met so many First Nations people, lovely, friendly, awesome people. And I'm just sold. In, in what does that mean? I'm sold. I'm just like, I'm so pro First Nations. I know it sounds kind of weird coming out of the mouth of a settler's kid, but, um, you know, we know we need more allies of First Nations people here in Canada, all Indigenous people. That includes Métis and Inuit, all right? Because, well, times are changing, and that's not really the reason why all of this is justified, but... It should have been going all along from the very beginning, right? So this is a territorial acknowledgement. That means I am acknowledging that here in the suburbs of Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, 
I'm borrowing the text from Kwantlen Polytechnic University, and I am respecting First Nations. So I know that's kind of a long rant here to start off, but here we go. We work, study, and live in a region south of the Fraser River, which overlaps with the unceded traditional and ancestral lands of the Kwantlen, Musqueam, Katsi, Semuyamu, Sawasin, Kikite, and Kwikwetlam peoples. And if you don't know who they are, you can go online and do some searches. There's a lot of information. And many of their members of these groups, they live right near me. Right? So that's what we call a territorial acknowledgement. So now, without further ado, let's get to Brad Zarnett and the interview. So hi, everybody. We're here at Multi Hazards again. I have a special guest all the way from Toronto, the biggest city in Canada and Vancouver. <gasps> We're number three. Oh, well. Uh, so he, yeah, from Toronto, Brad Zarnett. And I like him because he's a rabble rouser, just like I want to be, but <laughs> he actually does it. You should read what he, anyway, we'll, we'll get into what he's been writing. So, uh, hi, Brad, how are you doing all the way over there in Toronto? Um, Vin, thanks for having me. I'm doing well here in Toronto as we suffer a heat wave Oh, uh, with no end in sight. Um, but that's the, uh, that's what climate change gives us these days. So we have to take it in stride. Okay, well, here in Vancouver, we got a cold wave. I don't know what's going on. So we were on just on the beach a couple of days ago and enjoying the hot sun. But anyways, so um, first of all, I'm just wondering if you could uh, tell us briefly about your background and why you chose this field. Now, um, do I call it sustainability or are there some other words I need to kind of add into that um, phrase or word? Well, I think we can work with sustainability. It's an all-encompassing word for now, and I guess we can tweak it as we go. We'll see where it takes us. Okay, so how'd you get into this? Well, I, I've always found myself at the beginning of trends. Uh, in the early 90s, I was involved in the uh, financial industry as a financial advisor, just when mutual funds were, were um, starting to become very popular. And... Uh, uh, later in the 90s, I was involved in an internet uh, startup uh, that was bringing um, uh, different products and services to the architects and engineers of the world who would um, ask builders for the specs of the windows and doors and whatnot to build a building or um, something like that. And they would fax it to them. And the gentleman that uh, we were working with said, that's ridiculous. We have the internet. We can just put all that stuff online. And that business grew um, very quickly and it was eventually sold. And then I found myself thinking of what I would like to do next. And I got involved with, um, I had to make a decision. Did I want to, go and uh, secure an MBA, which I had no interest in doing, but it seemed like the thing to do, or would I follow my interests, which was more um, in the environment. And clearly I chose the environment. And I guess the epiphany that I had was, I was on a canoe trip in 2005 or six, and we were about four and a half hours north of Toronto in pristine wilderness. We got to a lake and uh, my uh, girlfriend said to me, look down at the water, you can see the bottom. And uh, sure enough, we could look down the water, you could see right to the bottom. And I asked why. And she said, well, that's what a dead lake looks like. And it wow. got me thinking about why why this lake would be dead in the middle of nowhere. And um, it made me realize that the tentacles of our way of life reach every corner of the planet. And um, I had a strong appreciation of the natural world and I started to look more deeply at it. And the more I looked, the more I found that we were causing some serious harm and I wanted to see if I could be part of the solution. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, I had a similar thing happen to me. I was working in Asia and just years 
breathing in coal dust from all the uh, coal heating and et cetera. And I just kind of looked out one day and said, I don't think humanity can survive. If we keep doing this, I don't think we're going to be here. It's going to be like one of those uh, Mad Max movies one day. It just, you know, I need to see some green trees with actual green, not gray. So, uh, yeah. And then I came back here to Vancouver and I was kind of like, uh, <clears throat> it's not as clean and unpolluted as we think it is. We just, you know, go on a bridge, overlook the Fraser River and see these clouds of, of pollution just like especially in summer so anyways oh it's good to get epiphanies though it's better than blindly going forward and not really seeing what we should be seeing so now um on your twitter it says sustainability strategist explaining how hashtag COVID-19 exposes a failed system and why corporate hashtag sustainability and efforts to combat hashtag climate change never had a chance. So I'm just uh, wondering here, how has this uh, COVID-19, which we're all kind of stuck in the middle of uh, after a few months, exposed a failed system? Like which system are you talking about here? Well, we, we live in a system of commerce that has spread around the planet and it has some serious shortcomings. Um, it does some, some things very well. Um, it creates incentive and it creates people with great imaginations to come up with amazing ideas. Um, and it allocates wealth based on the contribution that you add to society or the contribution that you add to the commerce model. It's not necessarily an advantageous to society with some of the things that people come up with um, that are purchased en masse uh, by people. Um, but when COVID-19 came along, <clears throat> it started to um, remove the curtain of what this system was all about. Uh, it was people who were involved in sustainability could see it long before COVID-19, but the rest of the planet was just trying to live their lives and get by and deal with a, a challenging um, marketplace that was paying them often wages that didn't allow them uh, to get out of poverty. Um, and it was um, causing great harm to our natural world. COVID-19 exposed that global societal challenges like COVID-19 are not well suited for capitalism to solve. Capitalism is a narrow, um, system um, that allows companies to look at a challenge, look at an opportunity that has not been met, and to meet that in the marketplace. Um, a degrading climate, um, plastic filling in our oceans, um, lack of or loss of biodiversity isn't something that an individual company can find a business case for. Uh, the same uh, as a business case for paying your employees a living wage is not a good business strategy for most companies. Most companies are trying to reduce labor costs, not increase them. So COVID-19 showed us that our system is not well suited to look after public health and well-being. And corporate sustainability is also a system that is too narrow to deal with the same um, environmental and social challenges. Um, and COVID-19 exposed that, the shortcomings of the system. People started to notice uh, that it's not working that well and the system isn't looking after them. Um, and it doesn't work when it's not um, addressed, when a challenge isn't addressed by a central entity like a government or a group of governments, um, it doesn't really get addressed. And um, individual businesses don't have a certain role um, on how to be involved or should they be involved? They're trying to make a profit, not solve um, the public health issues of an entire country or the world, unless of course they can make a profit from doing so. And not everything has a business case. And that's sort of where COVID and, and corporate sustainability interact with each other. Uh, and that's an article that I wrote not long ago that was very well received as people mm -hmm. began to comment back to me. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I've thought this way for a long time, but I've just, I've not been able to <clears throat> sort of express my feelings um, 
and I really appreciate you putting these. Uh, right. And you, is that the one you wrote? I think it was like mid March or something like that. Um, well, all the articles uh, are on my medium page. Right. And, but it was um, kind of like the, the beginning when the, 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 you know, what hit the fan in, in mid March when everything just kind of shut down across Canada, isn't it? Well, my first article was, hopeful um and i asked uh is COVID 19 a silver bullet for a stable climate right right yeah because I saw it that. Shut down the economic harm that we were doing unfortunately we tie um the metric of growth to the metric whether we want to or not of environmental uh destruction they go hand in hand and that's a problem right there but the article that you're speaking of um was called will fear of COVID-19 and loathing of capitalism drives systemic change. And the reason I titled it that way is that the fear of COVID-19 got us to make instant changes. We're wearing masks. We're not going near our friends. I mean, this is radical change that no one could have anticipated. But human beings can do incredible things when they feel fear. Um, and because the curtain has been pulled back on the failure of capitalism to address this public health issue, people are starting to see capitalism for what it's worth. So the fear of COVID and the distaste for capitalism is not enough to drive systemic change. And I explored that in that article. And it was, um, you know, again, very well received. Um, and uh, I'm out there to bring ideas to the forefront. Some right, people don't right. have the luxury of exploring these ideas. Exactly. They're just trying to earn a living. And um, um, so on that Twitter feed, sorry, you, you were saying, okay, um, about you're talking about efforts to combat climate change, never had a chance. Now, like end of August last year, I was like thousands, thousands of people in downtown Vancouver um, with that big climate protest. And there was a lot of like, it seems to be, um, what's the word here? There was like some uh, strength to that tidal wave of climate protests. And it seemed like there was a little bit of waking up happening around the world. And then all of a sudden, <clears throat> I don't know. Well, I guess winter things seemed to slow down a bit. And then COVID came in this, even the Fridays for future. It's like, we're going to go and protest online. So it, it doesn't really have the same bite as going on the streets and bugging the politicians. But um, so efforts to combat climate change never had a chance. So, what about that hope that we kind of had last year that, yes, there, there's something going to happen? Well, there's always hope. And I'm not suggesting in that phrase that there's no hope. Uh, what I'm saying is that if you don't address the foundation of the broken system uh, that encourages um, exploitation of the environment and people, you aren't going to find a solution to climate change. Um, it's not a system that will encourage uh, societal well-being. It's just not. It's looking at corporate opportunities for profitability, and you aren't going to find a solution w from within a broken system that is strictly looking at maximizing profits for corporations, despite what they say and despite their ideas of being woke and, and stakeholder capitalism. I've written about that too. Their words and their actions are inconsistent. Um, part of the reason that I do what I do is that I just feel like businesses and corporations are just um, misleading us. And um, I could use stronger language, but they're misleading us. And it puts us in a position where we feel like others are going to take care of this terrible problem and we don't need to worry because our governments are telling us it's going to be okay. Corporations are telling us that they're using a little less plastic. But the truth is that they are um, numbing us to the, the problems that are coming our way. And instead of getting in the streets every day and uh, demanding change, we sit back and thinking, well, this is a big problem. I got my own problems. I'm just glad someone's looking into it and we don't get up and, 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 and scream and yell like we need to. Mm -hmm. But it seems like there's, there is some, it's not just you, but there seems to be a lot of people aware that, Hey, these corporations are, they're not the solution. And uh, they're really part of the problem because for example, I, I can't remember it was Twitter or where it said that uh, African Americans in the, 
U.S. There was it was it California. Basically, was saying that they had traced you know where this person had got sick from COVID nineteen, and then they were kind of tracing it to um, friends and relatives, and all these people who had arrived in the hospital. A lot of them had been like restaurant workers or uh, working in a meat packing plant or something else. So it was kind of like showing that these are the people kind of stuck in the bottom jobs and they're more exposed to COVID-19. And it's like corporations, they just keep the meat packing and keep shipping out the meat and they just don't care. Like we had the people in the meat packing plants here in Canada and they just... They do this, oh, this is an essential service, keep it going. And then people got exposed to COVID-19. And it just seems like, as you were saying, if your bottom line is profit, like why would you care? You'll pretend to care just so that you can, you know, you'll be able to recruit somebody who's desperate enough. But at the end of the day, you're not caring. So, uh, yeah, as you're saying, the veil has been ripped aside. And it's like, well, where do we go from here? Well, the, the failure of the system is that the lobbying efforts of corporations is so powerful within the circles of government. Um, and I read uh, that the meatpacking industry had tremendous um, ability to lobby the U.S. government to say, deem us an essential service so we can continue to make money. Um, Anybody who was studying uh, COVID-19 knew that static air was a huge problem with people close to each other. And, um, you know, the government said, I deem this okay. People who work there are desperate. Nobody works in a meat packing plant, you know, dismembering animals and packaging them uh, because this is a life choice. Um, they work there because they have no choice. Um, because they're part of an economy that has kept minimum wage um, essentially flat since 1975. Um, so the system, if it keeps people desperate, then they're going to be forced to work. But what's interesting about the system is that the people who are demanding that we get the economy moving are the very ones who are saying, let's just make sure that I don't have to do anything in that work environment. It's okay for you to put yourself at risk. I'll give you a mask and you can wear some gloves and wash your hands and you know, everybody will feel like I'm not doing anything wrong. Um, but that's, that's not for me. <laughs> and I compare that to how people um, say that I, you know, I want the environment to protect, I want to protect the environment and I'm prepared to uh, use reusable bags and carry a coffee mug and I'll drive less and I'll use my bike more. Um, in, in, in a in a, um, in a questionnaire or an interview, they'll say all that. But when it comes down to it, uh, they have excuses why they don't want to do it. I need my car for work. I have different needs during the day. Um, I'm so busy in the morning. I can't figure out where a coffee mug is. Um, I, 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 I like to, to get in my motorboat and just enjoy my motorboat uh, in the summer. I mean, why can't I do that? Um, and people make excuses for themselves, but they would like to see everyone else um, follow the, um, the best practices to reduce environmental impact. And it's very much the same. We would like to see others do uh, the uh, heavy lifting, um, but we're not so much into doing it ourselves. Um, and if we had a government that was really serious about cracking down on the effects of climate change that are coming our way, it's coming. We can, you know, make the wave of climate change smaller, but it's coming, and that's what we're trying to do now: keep the wave uh, manageable. Um, and it's going to require some global changes, and mm -hmm. people don't want their governments to tell them what to do. Um, I don't want my government telling me what to do all the time, and that's the problem because we need our governments to tell us that certain things just are not acceptable anymore. Um, and until we come to the realization that we need to make drastic changes in how we live, we're probably not going to vote for a green choice. And mm. they've been out there for, for decades, but we continue to vote for politicians that uh, take half measures. And climate change isn't a problem that can be solved um, by individuals or business. It needs a central approach um, because there's no business case for much of it. 
So if we're not prepared to vote for a green government that's truly green, we're not going to make um, any meaningful progress. And that's where we are right now. We're, we're stuck because our collective awareness and awakening um, hasn't hit us yet. And I'm not sure what will do it. Hopefully it won't come when our global temperatures rise by two or three degrees because there's, not, there's no going back. You don't re-ice the Arctic. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it's already causing uh, enormous um, variations in temperature around the planet as the Gulf Stream becomes unstable, which is why the Siberia is having a heat wave uh, over 100 degrees, over 30 degrees Celsius uh, in the middle of June. Uh, that's unprecedented. And right. it's disrupting ecosystems. Can I go back to something you were saying now? I just got to tell you a little story. I've got a friend and he works for a major company here in Vancouver and uh, they have a kind of a, a factory. And uh, this is at the beginning of COVID-19. And he said the managers were in their little office with their big glass windows looking at all the workers uh, laboring away. And they were wearing masks, the managers were. But... Uh, they told the laborers, you know, yeah, whatever. You don't need to wear masks. This is right at the beginning. So, uh, yeah, my friend became a whistleblower. And then everything changed, like, within half a day. But it just kind of reminds me. Uh, you reminded me when you were talking about, like, the leaders who will be like, um, yeah, you can do the heavy lifting. But I'm going to just, you know, sit back in my cozy little living room overlooking this uh, beautiful ocean here in the sunset. So, it's um and the other thing too is about individuals like i had a couple of years where I was, I was just so shocked i'd just been studying climate change on my own i was just shocked to the core I had a lot of sleepless nights and i said okay i'm going to like get rid of my cell phone i'm going to just take my bicycle i'm going to have no car and so i did that for like 2 years and uh I think some of my family members wanted to kill me because I was such a pain in the butt. But I remember one day I had an epiphany and I was taking a long bus ride to uh, visit my dear father in a long-term care home. Uh, and it, it was far away. And I just saw smoke coming up from a bus in front of me. And then I realized, well, I'm sitting here paying for this bus and I'm contributing because I paid for that smoke, that those greenhouse gases to go into the air. My bike needs repairing and it takes, it burns greenhouse gases when they make this bike. And then when I change the tires, my shoes, it's like, I'm connected to this thing no matter what I do. And it just, it just, I was just frustrated because I said, you know, I, unless I like go deep into the mountains and, and live as a hermit, uh, it's just, I can't be sustainable. I'm just too stuck. So, and I, I think there are people really wanting to, who are willing to make the lifestyle changes, right? But just, there's a desperation thinking that we don't, we don't have those options. So I'm just wondering if you could speak to that. Well, <laughs> This is where the flawed system comes into effect. Um, you're making choices and the easiest and the least expensive choice is usually the most harmful choice. If you had a system that made it um, easier um, and less expensive to do things that didn't cause environmental and social harm, then we wouldn't be having this conversation. Um, mm -hmm. We have a system that is, uh, as I call it, it's a predatory system. Um, unregulated capitalism exploits uh, things that don't have a strong voice. The environment is one of them. Uh, future generations, people are not born yet. Indigenous people, people of color, um, people who have uh, low skills and are forced to work at meatpacking plants. It's a predatory system. And we allow it to uh, exist with very little regulation. Um, and we could change it. We could say, I'm going to have a system that gravitates to societal well-being. Um, and that's a form of energy and that form of production and that form of packaging. Those aren't good for our uh, environmental well-being, for our cancer rates, for our rates of asthma. So we're going to make those more costly and we're going to subsidize 
um, things that maybe uh, need a little assistance so we can have maximum well-being for our society. GDP is a terrible metric. Um, it may have served use in the past, but it's not working for us anymore. Um, but there are organizations and there are people and there are elites who are making a fortune off of this system and they're not really looking to change it and turn it upside down. Mm -hmm. So lobbying continues, politicians continue uh, to work uh, on behalf of corporations and we are stuck with a system that causes uh, environmental and social harm. So the fact that you are on a bus um, that's spewing um, pollution into the air, um, it's not your fault. And if you change your behavior and you um, access uh, or get to your, your, your visit your dad in a different way, um, that individual action on the grand scheme of things is a, a tiny, tiny piece of the puzzle. We need to change the system that allows it, uh, makes it possible for you to make the right choices. Um, asking individual citizens to go and investigate products and investigate ways of getting around based on carbon footprints and impacts, who has time for that? You need to make a system that uh, makes it uh, a downhill um, uh, move or a downhill trajectory for us to do well uh, and makes it uphill uh, to do things that cause harm. And right now it's completely opposite. Right. I interviewed somebody a week ago, Carrie Ann Charles, and she's uh, at First Nation there. I think it's called Georgina, Georgiana, First Nation in Lake Simcoe. And basically she was talking about indigenous voices and uh, perspectives on the environment. And basically it was like listening to nature and then going from there. And she said recently, She's been having some, a lot of interest and then working with the conservation authority um, there at Lake Simcoe, just on, on getting out the indigenous perspectives. But when she kept talking about listening to nature, right, it sounds almost like religious or metaphysical, somebody going into the woods and meditating, but it's like climate change now but we're getting storms more like greater uh frequency magnitude and it's almost like nature if we could kind of like anthropocize however say that word nature it's like it's, it's speaking to us and say this system's broken everybody you need to fix it or create well, something that's more like nature based more reality based so I, I'm, I'm not trying to get metaphysical here, but I'm just saying maybe this change because we have to adapt as a species or else we're not going to be here in a hundred years. Well, what you're basically describing is foreshadowing. Nature is foreshadowing what's coming our way. Uh, I did it in the massive fires in uh, Australia, the fires in California, um, the droughts, the heat waves, um, the melting of the Arctic. It's telling us what's coming. Um, but we're not paying attention because it doesn't affect us directly in a, um, in a meaningful way. The price of our food is going up slowly, hasn't reached a climax yet. I believe that's going to be the big um, explosion that causes uh, a massive uh, revolt against the system when people can't feed their families because the price of food has just gone up because crops are just not able to adapt to these rising temperatures. Um, they have been evolving for millions of years uh, based on a particular range in temperature. And when you exceed that range, you're going to see um, yields come down. You're going to see crop failure. You're going to see floods. You're going to see droughts. Um, and when there's less food, um, capitalism will exploit that. And um, it'll uh, charge a, a greater amount. Um, and then you talked about looking at nature. One thing about nature is that it, there's no waste in nature. Uh, nature reuses everything. Otherwise, it wouldn't be able to exist for millions of years. And all the garbage would, would, um, would pile up. Um, so there are efforts, uh, something called biomimicry, uh, which is um, a great uh, book that was written by uh, a woman named Janine Benyus. Um, mm -hmm. that would talk about you know, being inspired by how nature 
builds things uh, and how nature adapts using what's available. Um, so, you know, there are people who, who appreciate this, but the, the central powers of our government and our global system of commerce is not interested in making dramatic change because the people who have benefited so much from this system, that would be the 0.01%, have no desire to change it. There's thinking, you know what? I like the amount of wealth I have. I feel important. I feel like I'm sheltered from this. If there's a flood in my um, country home in, uh, in, in New Orleans, I'll just move to my country home in the Hamptons. And if that one gets hit by uh, uh, a tsunami, well, then I'll just move to my uh, home in uh, California. Mm -hmm. can, I, can I insert something here? Sure. Um, like I was kind of not shocked, but I was surprised to interview people from your province of Ontario in the east of Canada and then Maritimes. And a lot of people kept talking about cottages, cottages, cottages. I'm like, what is that? Uh, here in British Columbia, we call them cabins. And it's kind of like what, a second home, summer home or weekend. And honestly, like I've been teaching classes of uh, immigrants here and because of the uh, not tripling, but over the doubling and of housing prices here, they're all renting. It used to be where there'd be a, whatever, year four, year five of their sojourn here. They'd end up buying a, a condo or a townhouse or a single detached house, but not anymore. They're just like paying astronomical rents. And it's like people have second homes. It's just unimaginable. Like, yeah, I have a second home. And that second home might be better than the first home that a lot of us have here where I live. So it just, you know, it's not just the billionaires we're looking at. We're looking at people who've, who've managed to, to, to get that. So, uh, yeah, I know. You have everybody running off to cottages there on the weekends and the summers there in Toronto? Um, people who can afford cottages, uh, it's a beautiful place to be. <laughs> If you can, um, if you can afford a second one, a second home, um, but we're 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 swaying from the issue a little bit because now we've okay. been talking about sort of the, the, the economics and we got enough to talk about. Um, one okay. thing, a two, two comments you made that I want to just come back to. Uh, uh -huh. You talked about that that bus ride up to your uh, visit your dad, yeah, um, and how you ride your bike, and then you talked about getting new tires and then. You know, maybe getting a new chain because I ride a bike and my chain gets a little rusty in the winter and um, the uh, the need for um, new shoes and whatnot. But one thing you you didn't mention, which is a key component of riding a bike, is you need more food. And food oh, yeah. is a huge problem in terms of our greenhouse gas emissions. So oftentimes you don't think about the extra food that you need to eat if you're active. Um, and that's a whole problem right there. Um, and you also mentioned um, the whistleblower in the plant. Yeah, and, and it worked. I was surprised. They didn't kick him out. <laughs> well, here's, here's what uh, my next article I'm exploring. We have whistleblowers in government. And sometimes they speak up and sometimes they don't. Um, whistleblowers need to be protected. So they speak up. Um, the current administration in the States has um, punished people who speak up uh, against uh, that administration. Uh, making it less likely that will, people will speak up. Uh, but some people can't help themselves. They're so disgusted by what they see, they, they raise their voice and they say, I can't sit by and watch this occur. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a lack of whistleblowers um, uh, attacking the, uh, um, the administration in the States. Um, and we're going to go off a topic a little bit here, but I think it's all mm -hmm. interconnected. Um, What's happening down there, the uh, demonizing of certain people, um, the putting of people in cages, the, the securing the borders, uh, the targeting of people who are deemed uh, less than others, um, is, it, it resonates um, or, or, or is very similar to the type of fascism that was occurring in the past. And it's, it's, it's frightening. Um, and one could argue that the 
people being attacked are minorities, people who are poor, people who are not deemed strong, the strong American, uh, elderly. Um, these people are, are, are being left to be attacked by a virus that's attacking the very people uh, that an administration um, is speaking uh, badly against or um, is suggesting aren't part of a strong America. Um, and I've read articles where the author compares the lack of action on COVID-19 um, to the cleansing of the society because it's going after the very people that are not in line with a strong, um, dare I say, white America. Mm -hmm. So we can see some parallels of how um, the government uh, in the States has turned towards fascism. And the reason I mention that mm -hmm. is because it's so frightening that we need to stand up and we need to call it out. But you're not hearing that word very much in the States. Right. It's a loaded word. Can I just say something here about uh, when I read about uh, Nazi Germany? And uh, Yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry. I just want to finish the point because I'm halfway okay. through the week before. Yeah, yeah. Hold that point about Nazi Germany. So make a note if I want to get back to it. All right. What you're seeing is um, the administration and people close to it, they can see what's happening, but they're not calling it out and they're not using that word. And I compare that um, to the people who are close to corporate sustainability. Uh, there's no fascism there in corporate sustainability. There's just a network of systems that are doing um, very little in terms of meaningful work to protect our environment and our biosphere. And the people on the inside, they can see this. And we need those people to act as whistleblowers and call out the uh, work that's being done that is not meaningful. And the same way that people are not calling out the administration as behaving um, as fascists, the corporate sustainability whistleblowers due to very good reasons they need to keep their job they need to pay for their their family and their their home and all the other things that tie them to the system they're not calling out the the lack of action and the dare i say meaningless action and when i say meaningless i mean not effective towards the protection of our ecosystems some protection isn't going to get us where we need to be. So I say meaningless. It's not the meaningful work that we need to do to protect our ecosystems. And I see a very similar correlation by those two whistleblower groups who are standing silent. And if you go too far down either path, it can become a very serious situation, either with climate change or with a government that doesn't respect the norms of democracy right so that's the point that i wanted to make with whistleblowers and i think that we are missing the opportunity to call out the corporate sustainability industry and i understand why I mean, people have obligations jobs families they've built up a certain level of prestige in their sector um mm -hmm. they have good contracts they have clients who who want to hear from them so they 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 say i'm doing what i can i'm doing what good i can Right. And I would never dissuade somebody from doing good. I just don't think it's enough. Right. There's an Upton Sinclair quote that basically says that if you're depending on uh, on a, a wage, you're making a living from something, then uh, don't think that the uh, – anyways, I have to get it right here. Basically, if you're making money from something, you're not going to criticize it just because – you're depending on it. So um, I want to go to back to Nazi Germany. And um, I know a lot of people these days are kind of roll the eyes when, because everything is like Hitler, Germany, Nazi Germany. And even the Germans are probably sick and tired of us all using that example. But uh, when I read about imperialism from mainly from Europe and then uh, Nazi Germany, for example, there was a strong thing about Lebensraum getting more, land for the German people. I don't know why, because it looks like pretty huge landmass to me. And then I read a lot about the Jewish people there in Germany, and they had, uh, you know, they had settlements all over Germany. But it seemed like it wasn't just a thing about, oh, we hate Jews because they're Jews. No, it was it's basically trying to grab grab resources. So my theory is that a lot of this racism, a lot of this um, 
bullying, a lot of the, the core of the system is basically, I want more resources for myself and my group, and I want to take it out of the hands of other people. So, hey, let's just get rid of the Jews and take all the wealth, and then we'll send them off to Auschwitz and keep their gold and, or whatever they have, right? That's what uh, in Vancouver we did to the uh, Japanese people during World War II. We took all their businesses, their homes, their boats, their cars, boom, send you to the Rocky Mountains. And then that's the whole key to imperialism is going across the sea in ships and trying to grab the resources and then getting rid of the First Nations, the indigenous peoples, because it's not really them that you're focusing on, it's the land, it's the resource base. So it seems like that is one of the cores of the system is that I want to get more for me and it's not really less for you. It's because I don't care about you. So I'm not, I'm just doing what I need to do to get more for me. So I'm just wondering that what, what's your opinion, Brad? Well, you, you, you said a whole lot there. So let me unpack some of this. Uh, you're describing a system based on exploitation, right. um, exploit resources uh, where others live. Um, and then you, before you can do that, um, you need to identify those people as, as the Nazis did, because the Nazis didn't say, well, we need land, we're gonna take some land. They had to vilify uh, the Jewish people in order to build a mm -hmm. consensus among the German people that mm -hmm. these people were harmful to them. Right. So they labeled them and they critiqued them and they character caricaturized them as lesser humans subhumans much in the same way that the american administration is targeting the um people from central america um mm -hmm. the workers who pick mexicans. the crops the mexicans uh, central americans hondurans all those people who are trying to find a better life um they're not as good um they bring their as Trump said in his elevator uh, escalator speech, they're bringing their crime and their drugs. And I'm sure some of them are good people. He's, he's painting them as villains to America. And when you see something as less than you as a subhuman, um, then you don't mind putting them in cages or chasing them out of their homes and deporting them. So um, the, the correlation between what happened to the Jews it didn't just happen because they were looking for extra land. Um, they had to build a common enemy uh, mm -hmm. in Germany. Right, um, and, and it's not just Jews. They were doing it to any neighboring countries and saying, hey, Lebensraum, we want your land. Um, and uh, there was like a whole list of people they were vilifying. It's just that Jews were like the most well-known case, it seems. But it, it, it's all about resource grabbing. And I mean, that's... Isn't that the core of our stock market? Isn't that the core of our system is I get more and in the process, somebody else has got to lose. They got to get less. Everybody can't win. Everybody can't get more. Well, that's the, um, the culture that we live under that we're unable to break free from. Um, it, takes, it takes a lot of um, resisting the uh, narrative to say, I don't agree with that. Um, there is a lot of resources to go around. It's not shared well. Um, it funnels to the top, to the uh, supremely wealthy. Um, and some of those crumbs fall off the table. Maybe some, if you, if you can picture a table filled with sand and off of the sides of the table, some crumbs fall off. And, and that might be the 1%, the 2 the 3%. I'll even say the 5% are, are making, you know, some of that money that's falling off. The cottage you know, people. <laughs> well, you know, not everybody owns a cottage, owns the most beautiful, luxurious place. Some people love nature and they've found a way by working hard to get there. So I'm not going to okay. label cottage owners as being, you know, bad people. Um, it's, it's the, it's the 95% who aren't getting any of that that's falling off the table who are being victimized by the system. Um, they just have enough money to get by, pay their rent, and now their jobs have been taken away um, because there's a global pandemic with good reason. Um, and most economies around the world have tried to protect those people, um, mm -hmm. protect those jobs, you know, in various ways here in Canada, they're doing it, you know, people can find fault with it. 
Um, but the Canadian government is trying to help those people. Um, you know, down in America, where unregulated capitalism runs supreme, um, people were given 1200 bucks and they were sending to get back to work. Um, and they have no choice because they are desperate. They don't have any savings because the system doesn't allow them uh, to earn a living wage. Exactly. So the system is exploitive of people and the environment. Uh, poor people don't have much of a voice in politics. Uh, indigenous don't have a voice. Children don't have a voice. Uh, future generations don't have a voice. Uh, seniors visible don't. Minority. Well, seniors do have a voice, actually. Well, long, because... long-term care dwellers who are kind of well, from Alzheimer's. And... One. Um, they, didn't, they didn't protect them very well, certainly. Uh, which mm -hmm. is a whole fiasco and, and, and terribly sad story. Um, but the the exploitation is um, is easy when the people who are you're your exploiting don't have a strong voice. Um, and you know we're getting into all kinds of economics and and but it's it's a system that is failing to protect public well-being, and it is incentivized to do more harm than less right and if you have a system that has toxins at the base just like a crop on toxic soil if you try and come up with the most incredible seeds that are just pure and pristine and you put them in toxic soil you're not going to have a very good crop and right. that's the foundation of capitalism it's right. toxic now now brad a lot of people especially uh maybe safe of uh conservative perspectives here they would accuse us of saying well you 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 folk you guys are communist right you're just communist you just want to forcibly like take resources and just distribute it equally even to lazy people who are just sitting on their sofas and watching you know uh, uh disney plus or or netflix right that this is and uh i think most people they 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 don't know the history of communism they don't know that basically it's the same system just inverted and everything ends up going up to the top to this little elite group. But I uh, just, what, what, what can we say to those people? Cause any solution that you bring, they say that's communism. Like, what can we say? Am I getting off base here? <laughs> Oh, I think our internet is. I, I've lost. Uh, okay, I'm, you're back audio. again. Okay, so did you hear my last part there? I don't know what to do. Okay. No, I've, I've lost the audio. Can you hear me? Can you I think me? that was a good question, too. Uh, just. I can, um, hear it. can you hear it? Uh, Are you there? Uh, can you hear me? Hi, are you there? Hi, are you there, Brad? Sorry about that, Brad. I'm back. Okay, sorry about that. I don't know what happened no to worries, my. No worries. No worries. They have good internet. Yeah. So, um, um, yeah. Uh, did you hear the tail end of that question? You got it all. No. All, all I heard was the the an interesting question that coming my way about people who don't see it our way. Uh, oh, yeah, and, and then basically, yeah, there are people out there and basically anything that's different than this capitalist system, they're like, you're a communist. And it's like, I, I remember listening to an audio book, The History of Communism, and it's, it's pretty negative. And it's basically, yeah, it's take all the resources. Everybody is kind of sort of semi-slave labor, and it goes up to the top. So what's the difference? It's the same thing, just with another label, except, you know, and, and the diff different mechanisms. So I'm just, what, what, what can we say to these people? Because I'm well, sick and tired of hearing that, you know, you're communist. It's just like, shut up. Have you read anything about communism, mate? You know? there, there's a narrative in the United States that yeah. they have found the best system. And um, there's a narrative that communism is a, um, ex is a system that will um, essentially take away all your rights and turn you into some sort of... Uh, um, factory worker or, or farmer or something. I mean, obviously there's different uh, skill sets now than there were in the 1920s yeah. when, um, you know, 
Russia was going through its um, move towards communism. But um, you cannot criticize capitalism in a society that is so resistant to allowing that um, conversation to occur. The same way as you couldn't in you know, the 1940s and 50s and 60s stand up in downtown Moscow and say, I believe strongly that capitalism is good for our country. You couldn't do it. You would be seen as a, um, as a leper in society. So it's very hard to have a conversation and say that there are some aspects of a, uh, a co-op model, which essentially is where the people who do the labor for an organization have a say in how it's run. Um, mm-hmm. and sharing the profits. Having a real say, not just like on paper. <laughs> well, they sit on the board and they, they, they make decisions uh, because they're affected by it. Mm-hmm. And there are parts of the world, uh, Spain has a very interesting co-op uh, system. I don't remember exactly what part of Spain, but it's come, become quite large um, and it works quite well. And a co-op system just gives uh, the say to the people who work at the organization. Do we want to go hard left towards straight up communism? No, nobody is suggesting that. Uh, we're suggesting that this hard right turn that's been made in the last 40 years is not working for us. It needs more regulation. It needs to be adapted. And um, people who can't allow that conversation to occur, um, you know, I'm not sure how you, um, you, you, you engage with them. Um, it's, it's, it's not easy. People have a viewpoint for a reason. Um, it might be because they have lived in a society uh, that has told them something for their whole life and their worldview is fixed. Uh, and you're not going to get them to see things differently. Um, mm-hmm. And there's probably no reason to try because right. you're just going to get into an argument with someone. Uh, so you, you need to gauge who you're talking to and you need to um, put forth ideas that um, that offer a a different way of organizing the the economic system, which has also our political system. Um, But the the happiest and the most healthy countries in the world are social democracies. Um, The United States is is, as far from the happiest and most successful country in the world. You could say that it's the first uh, poor rich country because Mm -hmm. the amount of poverty in the United States is uh, unsettling. And the amount of people who don't have access to uh, $400, I think was the number used, um, or pay for an emergency is, is, is enormous. Like 60% of the population, the people mm-hmm. who go bankrupt because of um, uh, health care being um, incredibly overpriced uh, is incredible. The amount of people who have enormous debt because they just wanted to get an education um, what the United States has done is it's taken these public goods, um, health care, providing health care for all citizens, um, providing an education for your citizens. Um, it's, it's privatized that and mm-hmm. it's turned it into a great business opportunity, um, but it's terrible for society. Right. And that's where the public goods have become private goods. And uh, you look at um, flourishing countries those public goods are strong. Yeah, Um, like in Nordic countries, right? Nordic countries, uh, Germany has some some excellent programs. Their their unions are strong in Germany because they're part of the decision-making process. Um, Unions are not a bad thing. If you want to work six and a half days a week, then, you know, unions were a bad idea. But unions give a collective voice to people who have no voice, the poor. So give them a collective voice give them a living wage, allow them to um, educate their children, and you'll see all of society lifted up together. Um, But if you grew up in an environment that said the individual can do anything they want, they control their own destiny, everything they do is based on their own hard work, it doesn't matter that society gave them amazing infrastructure for roads, for telecommunications, for education. Um, That's why there's a great workforce that you can collaborate with if you think that you did it all on your own because of your own hard work, then I think you're missing the story. And I think you have a skewed view of the importance of a strong society. Right. Now, just kind of pivoting sideways here, I'm just wondering, um, I think 
I saw in a couple of your articles, you're talking about the Matrix movies and the, the blue and the red pill. And I can't even remember like what the, the red and the blue symbolizes here. But um, I just wonder, is there some kind of connection here to everything you've been saying with, with that theme in the Matrix? And well, you can tell we're old, right? Like these movies, what, came out in 1999? <laughs> They're going to do part well, four soon. Yeah. They're classics. So uh, yeah. we're, we're, there's a lot of people who are familiar with the references. Um, that's exactly what I was just talking about. If, if you are unable to see beyond what's being said to you, then you're not going to accept a different system. Um, you're going to say that government is the problem. As Reagan said in the 80s, government is not the solution to our problems. Government is the problem. That is a great slogan, but it's not true. Government plays an important role in societal well-being that business can't begin to address. Um, and it's, it's a matter of saying, I'm prepared to see the truth of what our system is doing as opposed to, I like my worldview. It's worked for me. Um, my job in the oil industry pays me enormous amounts of money. And it doesn't make sense for me to go to work and tell all my colleagues that they're all causing the world to be destroyed. All that's going to do, it's going to alienate me from my coworkers. It's going to keep me out of big meetings with my coworkers because what do they want to hear from me for if I'm just telling them they're bad and they're wrong all the time? It's going to cause my ability to get promotions. It's going to interfere with that. And it's probably going to get me fired before long, if not immediately, because you are a voice that is contrary to a system that is great, creating great wealth to people who live in a capitalist world where money allows you to live and have choice. And to criticize it, is not a good thing for people who are deeply tied to that system. Mm -hmm. And it's understandable. And that's why the people in the oil producing countries and provinces and states are so opposed to the ideas of climate change. The countries that, that fight hardest against it are the United States, Canada, Australia, Saudi Arabia, and Russia. Mm -hmm. All of them are huge um, petro economies. And that's, that's the problem. We have a global system that is um, allowing these, this method of energy to continue to be used, hopefully by those who are profiting from it until we run out of it, right? Let's use it all up and then we'll come up with something new. Right. Unfortunately, we can't do that. Right. Now, Brad, we're going to have to do a, another episode sometime, but um, <laughs> so. I'm running out of time here, but uh, I love what you're saying. I think you are what we call a thought leader. I think uh, your your thoughts matter, and uh, they uh, we need to explore these themes much, much more. You're uh, a big part of the conversation. I wonder if you have any last uh, message for the audience. After all that we said, I want I want to change the conversation. Uh, and I want to get people to explore ideas that they didn't feel necessarily safe to discuss. Um, I wrote it, my, la my most recent article, I looked at our ability to make individual choices and how that is so important to changing the direction on environmental destruction or degradation or mm -hmm. ecosystem uh, degradation. We need to change our habits. And then in the article, I say, and what you do absolutely makes no difference, <laughs> which is a complete contradiction. Yes. And the reason I say that is because it doesn't matter what you do. What matters is that you appreciate that change is needed. And only when you appreciate the change is needed will you begin to see that the change needed isn't an individual change or a business change. It's a global change to address global issues. And when you see that, and these issues can only be addressed by government, business is not, it's ill-suited to address these challenges because of its narrow focus on the business case. So when you appreciate that these issues are meant or are best uh, 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 addressed by governments, only then 
will you begin to say, I'm ready to make these changes, but I realize these aren't, these aren't what's important. I need to empower a government, a green government, a truly green government, not a liberal or conservative, but a truly green government that will make the choices necessary that will add uh, a meaningful change to what we in fact need as a society and as a planet. And until we're ready to accept and step away from the benefits of capitalism, and there are many, we are not ready to vote for that green leadership because they will tell us to give up the things that we have become used to. We have to give up those things. We have to make the individual choices first. So when we vote in that green party, the changes they propose just roll off our back because we've already made the decision that those are not good for us. Mm -hmm. That's powerful. <laughs> and uh, honestly, I think this whole podcast episode is like a, a chapter one. This is a long book that needs many chapters. So thank you so much, Brad, for, uh, for enlightening us and, and, and diving deep into this uh, topic. And uh, we're going to have to talk again sometime. So thank you so much. And everybody, let's just get out there and do what we can. Let's keep our minds sharp. And uh, thanks again, Brad. You have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks, Dan. Greatly appreciate it. And keep up your good work. Okay, thanks. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. There it is, everybody. A great, insightful interview with Brad Zarnett. So thank you again, Brad, for being a very special guest here at the Multi-Hazards Podcast. Now, little disclaimer here that I add to every episode, and that is this podcast is meant to be educational. I'm educating people, all right? And it does not try to offer legal, I'm not a lawyer, medical, I'm not a doctor, or other specific advice. I'm not an engineer or something else like that, unless otherwise noted, all right? So the opinions expressed here do not necessarily reflect those of the organizations that the host or the guests are part of, all right? So any place we work for, we get paid from, or any place we volunteer or associate with, that's their opinion. They have their own thing going, and we have our own opinions as individuals, okay? Do you get that? That's called a disclaimer. All right. So here, as I finish this episode, thanks to all of you precious listeners. I really, really appreciate you, and I'm going to try to just keep pumping out very good quality material about multi-hazards. That is my commitment. So unless I get COVID-19 and a couple of weeks I expire, you better expect some really good stuff coming out from multi-hazards podcast. All right. Stay safe out there and stay tuned for more. Vin Nelson here wishing you the best on your journey of surviving and thriving with all that life throws at you. Cheers to you all and peace out.